the point is really that we have to distinguish, let us say, the historical processes which are infinitely complex and infinitely elaborate, then we have to distinguish the writing of history. And that is what one calls historiography. There is this strange aspect of history that we cannot write just history. We have to write history of something. And there is another important thing, and that is that if we have no problems, history wouldn't be very interesting. And problems are problems to explain. Of course, every historian who has ever done what is called historical research knows that when he goes into an archive or a public record office, he cannot possibly read all the millions of documents there. His research is really a search for an answer to a question, whether it is when a certain picture was painted or how many ships arrived at a certain port from the Far East, or, as you say, more importantly, how certain things developed and became what they are now. Uh, it is often said, of course, that school children should not only learn the sequence of kings and of battles, But those who say so, uh, they often mean that they should only be taught the history of the class struggle. Now, I wouldn't deny that the history of exploitation and the fight ex against exploitation is also an interesting topic of the kind you alluded to. But I think it would be very important if at school children would learn there was a book by Paul Dane called Everything Has a History, would learn that one can be curious about how anything arose in our lives. And often the question leads us to very surprising and interesting answers. I think there are no historical laws, but there are situations which More, more or less, certain aspects, of course, repeat themselves. If we want to explain something in history, we have to take these typical situations, make, as it were, a kind of model of them, and use then this model in order to explain certain events. So, for example, the model of availability of books leads, in essence, it seems, to democracy. And a similar consequence, more complicated, we find in the Renaissance. Our own time, our Western democracy, may be said to be very largely a consequence of the printing press, if one thinks it through. There are quite a number of examples of such historical explanation which explain things, of course, only conjecturally, which at first seem almost inexplicable. So you have spoken in this context of the logic of situation. Yes, that is And that really. is a very valuable the idea. The logic of situation. By the logic of situation, I mean that we analyze a situation in such a way that the actions of the people in that situation are then simply the 
optimal actions which these people in their own interest can take. I would, however, say that it does belong also to the logic of situ the situation that people in acting make mistakes. Mistakes are unavoidable and can be, although in a way they are illogical, but they can be incorporated in the logic of the situation. The problem of democracy is the avoidance of tyranny, and it is a great problem because of the popular leader. There may be a popular leader, he may have democratic backing, and with democratic backing, as it were, with the legitimacy of the people, he may become a tyrant. We have that in Greece, it is described by Plato as typical, and we have it again in the English Revolution, and we have it again under Hitler, just to give a few such very characteristic cases. And for this reason, I believe that it is important that democracy, even though it is translated as rule of the people should be interpreted not as a popular rule because the people may, may authorize a tyrant, but as that kind of structure where the people have the power to dismiss the government, to get rid of so I have not only now spoken about history, but actually about politics, but these two are closely related. What you just said about democracy having to do with an effort to prevent tyranny, again applies particularly well to the story of Florence in the 14th and 15th century. The Florentines were so anxious to prevent tyranny by preventing uh, anybody from ruling alone uh, that they introduced a very complicated system of elections to offices, each of which should not last longer than sometimes two months or four months. And this very complicated system of elections, of course, was stultifying. Uh, it one might say that it led to Medici rule as an unintended consequence because it wasn't workable unless some people uh, really maintained the continuity and also the continuity of power in foreign politics and in other matters. So that here you have an example of the error which you mentioned before, which can creep in to a situation if it isn't possibly properly thought through, or even if it is thought through. So, this uh, your logic of situation doesn't mean, as I understand it, that the logic is compelling in the sense of determinism. Now, historical determinism is something which has grown out of natural determinism, of the idea that there are natural laws which determine completely what happens, similar then there are historical laws which determine what happens. But while I think there are natural laws, even though not really deterministic natural laws, I think they are hardly anything like historical laws. The whole de idea of determinism goes, of course, again back to the gods who determine 
what happens in our world. From here it is then taken over with the development of science, where instead of the gods, the natural law explain everything. And then with the evolution of history and of historicism, arises the idea that historical law determine and explain everything. But I think that this is a false dogma, one of the many false dogmas which have played a role in historiography. Perhaps we might say that there is another false dogma which is particularly popular today, which I might refer to as relativism in history. It has to do with your idea about the logic of situations. It denies, in a way, that we can ever explain or understand another period or another culture because all the presuppositions are so different, and the context of every statement is so different, that we will never understand, let us say, uh, something said in ancient Greece or anywhere, or in Florence or anywhere else, because the framework within which these statements are made is so different that we cannot reconstruct it ever. You have written in this context, in an article of which I am very fond, that this doctrine confuses a great difficulty with an impossibility. It arises from the modest realization that we haven't really quite understood yet. But this should not lead to a nihilistic attitude it cannot be understood, but only to realizing that our task is very difficult in our task in understanding and that a lot of work should go in, a lot of thought should go in, and a lot of imagination has to go in. Obviously, anybody may say, how do you know that you are so successful? You may only imagine that you are so successful. Nevertheless, in this way of historical search and research, we do discover more and more facts, and the facts do fit better and better together into a picture. Yes, there are, of course, models of tremendous successes in historical research, like the deciphering of some ancient scripts, which we can now read, and so we may not understand them completely, we certainly understand them better than before it was possible yeah. to read them at all. That is really, we cannot answer relativism by saying we know now definitely, dogmatically, we have it all in our pocket now, but we can answer relativism by the claim that we have made definite progress. Right. That is possible. Of course, without the imagination, without speculation, no historian can get anywhere. He would All that we would have left is a list of facts and dates which may also be wrong. And in so far, I quite agree with you that there must be an ingredient in any historical work of imagination, of construction, of hypotheses, and uh, that goes not only for more immediate situations, but also for the development of, of the human race, if you like. You have written a good deal about the dangers of psychological explanation in the logic of situation, but you have also used certain psychological elements in some of your writings, and one of them is the sense of drift, 
caused by the absence of a closed society, which you discussed in your book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. The idea that the freedom of the open society also causes a kind of psychological reaction, a longing for the shelter of the tribal closed society, as you called it. We cannot, I think, quite get away from this kind of explanation, nor would you want to, I believe. It interests me very much because I have also, in the context of explanations, used certain psychological facts or factors. For instance, the difficulty of learning to represent the world accurately if you haven't learned it. This is part of the theme of my book on art and delusion, that you can only do this by trial and error and learning from your predecessor. And from your mistakes. And yeah. from your, yes, trial and error, yeah. of course. Uh, that is, I think, a very important point because it does not contradict the logic of the situation. It's part of the logic of the situation that we are just so made that we can't simply make a tracing of the view outside without uh, attempting to interpret it, to learn it, about it, etc. So that in this and in other respects, I think, the logic of situation should not be misinterpreted as claiming that people are always logical. Uh, if somebody, for instance, doesn't want to start a business on Friday the 13th because he thinks it's an day of ill omen, he is perfectly logical or rational in not starting a business because that is his belief. And in many interpretations of situations, we find these beliefs playing a great role. Mastery of a skill is, of course, something which interests me very much because it's part of, of art and of the history of art. Uh, Bach didn't have to think very much when he wrote the fugue. I mean, he knew exactly how to do it. Uh, of course, he was exploring, but within a given field which he knew perfectly well. That is to say, it's very different for Bach to write a fugue as it is for me or you to write a fugue. I know you have written fugues, but even so, uh, that is a very different thing. The degree of mastery, which starts on a certain platform, as it were, which makes it possible to make fresh discoveries and fresh exploration. I completely agree with you that we explore the world, we obtain knowledge up to a certain level and starting on this new level we right. have a new starting point and so on. I completely agree with that but I would say this again is a kind of trial and error working and not, uh, not really the repetition which leads to forgetfulness, uh, that is to say to automatization no to banning it from our consciousness. But it is a very important point, you see, let us say in modern art teaching, that everybody should just fool around as they like uh, and not learn the mastery of the, uh, of the masters. Yes. And I, in that I, respect, I, they I, have to learn in a, in a very disciplined way. Yes. I completely agree with you. I have often formulated it by saying, if we start from Adam, we won't get any further than Adam did. <laughs> Quiet. We should perhaps say here that what bearing this has on history. Hmm. It has because it throws light on the continuities, both in the history of science and in the history of art, that there's always a platform from which the next yes, apprentice is starts. This is very important and this continuity should not be interrupted. And this continuity should also be understood as a part of problem solving. Right. It is within 
problem solving, there are also solved problems. Yes, yes. And then we go on to new problem yes, solving. Yes, that's right. We have solved problems and go on to new problems, and the new problems can only be solved by trial, error, and of course, in art, especially by evaluation. Right. But there are elements of technology in that. Let yes. us say, in architecture, vaulting the vault. Yes. Once it was solved, you could go on to new things like building cathedrals. You couldn't yes. do that before. Or building skyscrapers. <laughs> or building skyscrapers. <laughs> We are both, in a sense, historians, and we can hardly imagine what it would be like not to know anything about the past and to live entirely in the present. It seems to me a pity that some people try to do that because they are deprived of many beautiful experiences and much important knowledge just to understand how the world has become what it is today, even if our Knowledge is always conjectural. I do agree, and it is impossible for anybody who has any interest in history not to see that our world, the world in which we now live in the Western countries, is really the best and most beautiful world which has so far existed. It is the justest world, the freest world, and the world fullest of opportunities. And in addition to all that, it is the world which has become most critical of itself. Of course, very many people fall into historicists' and other ideology, ideologies and believe that we are living in a very bad world. As a matter of fact, in a way, there is a kind of religion that we live in a social hell. I think that is fantastic and completely mistaken. And anybody who knows any history can easily show that it is quite mistaken and that the world has never been as good as this before and as hopeful as this before. Of course, the future about the future we know nothing but that it is open, that it is not predetermined, and that it will depend on our efforts, whether it will be better or worse than it is now. It is we who are really making the future. And whether we can further progress, I don't know. There is no such a thing as progressivism, that is to say, a necessity to progress or anything of that. We can always also regress if we do not really work for betterment directly, not for prog progress, but for a better world. <music> Thank you.